this is going to be a little bit of a different kind of presentation in that I'm not actually presenting um, any of my own data. It's kind of more of conceptual information and based on experiences that I've gleaned along with um, some of my past colleagues from Utah State um, in working with beaver in a variety of settings and then also based on a recent literature review that I've done on uh, beaver in California estuaries and estuaries in general. So just wanted to give a quick uh, shout out to my um, past uh, advisor and boss, Joe Wheaton and uh, Wally McFarland from Utah State University. I'm using some of their work here. So kind of already covered this stuff here. Um, had the opportunity to work with Beaver uh, throughout the Intermountain West for the last couple of years, and so I'm excited to take some of those lessons that we've learned in those settings and try and see how they fit back here on the North Coast. So um, there's a variety of different workshops that for people that are more interested in learning a lot more of the details about Beaver and Beaver-assisted restoration. We have an upcoming one here at the San Juan Restoration Federation Conference in Davis uh, this next spring. Um, and so I'm just going to jump right in again. This is, this is pretty conceptual and it's going to be a little bit of a fire hose and then I'm trying to cover quite a bit of ground, but I'm going to just be talking briefly about some of the basics of estuaries, uh, degradation um, having to do with estuaries and uh, how that relates to beaver extirpation and then move into some basics on beaver ecology and dam building and um, how their role as ecosystem engineers can be uh, worked with in a restoration context to try and achieve um, some restoration objectives. And then I'll just briefly mention um, some tools that can help with that. So maybe asking yourselves, how does this relate to redwood science? It's a little tenuous. I don't really think that um, beaver had a real uh, strong role historically in the deep dark redwoods, but most of these redwood forests all, all here on the north coast all terminate in estuaries and beaver have um, historically and currently still play a big role in that estuarine environment. So historically estuaries were uh, very dynamic depositional areas composed of a complex network of um, varying salinities supporting a range of stream velocities and habitat types. Um, the high natural sediment supply of Northern California rivers coupled with the adequate hydrology to move that sediment around would have translated into high rates of lateral migration, overbank flow, and channel avulsion in these dynamic settings. Um, with real high water table, low gradient, wide valley bottoms, you wouldn't have probably seen the redwoods down in those valley bottoms too much because of how wet it was and the salinity, but you would add spruce, alder, willow as kind of the dominant tree species with a variety of different salt tolerant shrubs, forbs, and other grasses present with the red slope, redwoods sort of fringing the hill slopes. So more on just basics of estuaries, you know, that essentially they serve as a buffer between the ocean and the river, and, you know, that can have real important implications as we're thinking about uh, changing sea level and uh, trying to deal with climate change. So um, obviously they play a big role in benefiting flood control and water quality. They're highly bi biologically productive areas supporting um, a variety of different habitat types. The Southern Oregon and Northern California Coho Recovery Plan and a bunch of other studies identify the loss of estuarine habitat and beaver trapping as primary factors leading to the ESA listing of coho. Um, the geomorphic and ecological setting, uh, particularly historically, would have translated into excellent beaver habitat. So as we know, estuaries aren't doing very well. Um, nationally, we've lost about two-thirds of them over the last century. In California, we've lost over 90%. These are, sorry about the quality of these figures. They look a little washed out. Maybe it's a little bit better on that uh, screen back there. But um, basically, these are just some images from uh, the SFEI, San Francisco Estuary Institute, looking at historic uh, distribution of habitat types uh, in the San Francisco Bay Delta and how that's changed from now. So. Typically what we see with estuary degradation is you take something, this big, wet, messy area with a complex, multi-threaded plan form, high water table, all those things I said before, and you know, we want to use that land, so we diked, drained, uh, levied all this to create these confined, sort of single-threaded channels that obviously um, have a much more simplified uh, type of habitat that's present there. There's uh, a lot of uh, important implications for changing the way that the, the levels of water table and the amount and inundation of the floodplain there. So heavily altered settings for obvious reasons. That's kind of prime land that we've liked to use historically. So widespread estuary degradation took place in Northern California and really throughout California, largely after beaver had already been extirpated 
And this uh, transition into this type of estuary has coincided with the decline of Pacific salmonids throughout their range, but also in Northern California. So there's been historically some debate um, about whether beaver are native to Northern California or not. There's been a lot of recent evidence to uh, show that they were here uh, historically. And there's um, so some recent work, Landman et al. and Lundquist et al. from 2013 have done a really great job of compiling a lot of different types of evidence to kind of show where the beaver were. Um, and there's evidence from most of the Northern California watersheds here that, that we're interested in that beaver were present at some level there. Um, unfortunately, you know, the large spread era of beaver extirpation took place before a lot of things were getting written down. So it's easy to see how folks back in the late 30s, early 40s um, kind of came up with that reduced uh, range that, that has been proven to be somewhat inaccurate. Um, some of those estuary beaver would have been particularly vulnerable to the maritime fur trade and the Spanish missions as early as the late 1700s and early 1800s. All that beaver fur was going to make these great hats that rich people in Europe loved for a long time. So um, fortunately, California beaver and beaver nationally are on the rebound. There's increasing evidence of their past occupation in a lot of watersheds around here, as well as recent reestablishment into areas of their historic range. Um, we've seen a lot of that has to do with a reduction in trapping pressure. It just isn't really economically viable to go after beaver for their fur like it used to be. And natural predation is down, as well as some significant land use changes in these sort of valley bottom areas that have helped to um, ha bring their numbers back up. So now that they're back around on the landscape, they're starting to uh, do what they do. Um, and so we have an opportunity here to think about working with them in a restoration context. So. Now I'm going to talk just briefly about a little bit about beaver, some restoration strategies using beaver, and then techniques to deal with their unwanted or nuisance behavior. Um, so I'm specifically going to focus on their role as ecosystem engineers, because it's really their dam building that, in terms of river restoration that we're kind of the most interested in. And then talk briefly about where in the landscape these strategies make sense. They don't make sense everywhere. So. Um, the hope here is, is that beaver can help us restore degraded streams, rivers, and estuaries for a lot less money than traditional methods. You know, we're putting the beaver to work and um, also creating a restoration model that increases local employment opportunities by getting people out into the stream, helping to build beaver dam analogs, which I'll mention a little bit later in the talk, um, that are essentially uh, structures that mimic the form and function of beaver dams and that through this work will promote, promote much more dynamic behavior in streams and river that can lead to better water quality, healthier ecosystems, and higher biodiversity. But with all these great things about beaver, we can't forget that they basically build dams wherever they feel like. So that can be a problem, obviously, especially in more urbanized settings or in places where, in estuaries, where there's a lot of land use going on. So. Um, you know, they block culverts, they can chop down the trees that we plant and make a mess of irrigation diversions. Fortunately, there are uh, a lot of options these days uh, that we call living with beaver strategies to try and deal with some of this unwanted nuisance behavior. And again, I'll just mention that briefly. Um, this is also kind of washed out, but um, now I'm going to be talking just briefly about beaver biology. So. Um, they're considered habitat generalists and highly adaptable, so they can make a living in lakes, uh, rivers and streams, abandoned channels on floodplains, as well as in freshwater and brackish wetlands and tidally influenced wetlands. Um, so a recent paper from Skagit Bay Delta Estuary in Washington from 2012, Hood et al. went and mapped out the distribution of beaver dams um, in the upper portion of the estuary there. And what you can see is a high density of dams 10.2 per kilometer, but tending to be sort of outside of the, the, the lowest kind of downstream zones of the estuary where you get more of that full salinity and a higher tidal exchange. But even up in these reaches, you still have tidal exchange going on and you still have some salinity and they're doing just fine up there. So um, being generalists, they can basically exist all over the place, all throughout Northern California. This is uh, reflective of the sort of outdated range map that doesn't include their distribution in Northern California and Southern Oregon, as well as portions of Nevada and Utah. That has since been shown to not really be accurate. But um, really, all they're limited by is wood and water of the right amounts. So being opportunistic rodents, they eat whatever's around. Um, but in the spring and summer, you know, they typically will eat more herbaceous plants and then switch to a more woody plant-based diet in the wintertime, particularly in, in northern climates. So in northern climates, they're really reliant on these uh, food caches. And even in temperate climates, you know, they like to stockpile a lot of woody plant material that they can eat off of. 
throughout the winter that they can then maintain underwater access to from their lodge out in the pond. Um, they're considered sort of your classic central place foragers where instead of foraging from the nest, they move out from the lodge and um, will again sort of eat whatever's there. They do have preferences for a lot of different types of hardwoods, um, but they will eat conifers and they'll use conifers in their dams. Um, they typically only go about 100 meters or less from water. So um, now shifting gears a little bit into why they build dams, they don't build dams everywhere. They build them in places where they need to create habitat that works for them. So obviously they don't really care about restoring rivers. They just want to create these ponds so that they can, one, um, escape from predators, two, expand their foraging pathways, and three, provide a place to build their lodge and have that access to underwater food cache. And all of this is because they're much more agile and much more geared towards life in the water. They can and do move on land, but they're much more um, uh, vulnerable to predation in that kind of setting. So it's the dam building that provides all the important feedbacks that from a restoration perspective we're interested in. One of the primary ones is they essentially serve as these sort of speed bumps in the stream uh, slowing down the transit, transit of sediment and nutrients as they move downstream. And by doing so, what that does is it accumulates the sediment over time, but it strongly influences the hydraulics in the channel to spread more of that flow out onto the floodplain, effectively watering the floodplain, expanding riparian areas, and uh, creating and maintaining wetland areas. Um, dams can also, at a high enough density, actually change the hydrology of watersheds. So, there's been work, this is just a conceptual diagram, but essentially what happens if you have a high enough density dams is you can see a reduction in peak flows and an extension in magnitude and duration of your late season flows. Do beaver impact fish? There's been a lot of, a lot of looking at the potential harm that beaver dams could have on fish. Um, and I'm not going to say that they, under no circumstance anywhere, don't potentially provide, you know, cause a problem for some fish species. But when you look at all the primary literature up until 2012, like this guy Kemp did, um, and you know, summarize all that. The majority of the work looking at the potential negative effects of beaver dams have all been uh, speculative. I mean, there there is some data-driven stuff out there, but the vast majority of it is sort of expert opinion. And what we've seen working throughout the Intermountain West is that beaver dams not only don't cause a problem to fish, but they actually can strongly aid in the recovery of endangered salmon. So. Some recent work from Ballas et al. in 2016 from an incised river in southern Oregon. This isn't, um, sorry, more like central eastern Oregon Bridge Creek. Some of you have probably heard about this story before. Um, not in an estuary, but what um, those folks there found is a population level watershed scale increase in the density, survival, and production of juvenile steelhead due to the restoration intervention of natural and artificial beaver dams. This data set is the only one like it of its kind that I'm aware of. I don't think there's been any population level response to a restoration action that I'm, that I'm aware of. So this is, this is a big deal in a lot of ways. And they've you know, had the money to really study the heck out of this. This is an intensely modern watershed. It's part of the Columbia River watershed. They had eight years to look at all this stuff. They tagged over 35,000 steelhead, had four stationary pit tag antennas, and then uh, yearly mobile surveys looking at fish movement and found no impact to fish movement throughout this heavy density of beaver dams. Um, so beaver benefit endangered salmon is not only in these incised river settings, but in estuaries. So there's already a lot of studies out there dating back to the mid-60s. This is an incomplete list kind of looking at the literature review of beaver dams effects on Salmonids in particular in estuaries, and you know this is just sort of a summary of the positive benefits that we see: increase in flow refugia, increased foraging opportunities, increased size and productivity for uh, coho in particular that spend time in beaver ponds relative to not in beaver ponds, more cover, higher overwinter survival, and that their dams can prevent seasonal floodplain drawing. Drawing. I'm going to just walk through this diagram from Bowes et al. real quickly here, so because this kind of summarizes a lot of the. Uh, effects that dams have on fish habitat. So there's the little outline of the fish and then the little outline of the beaver here and then the sort of physical responses from the dams. So the dams elevate water levels, which immediately creates more pool habitat for fish through the um, impounded water that creates pressure differentials that can increase the amount of groundwater exchange. And you can actually see cooling by displacing that cooler hyperreic flow water and making that, forcing that to do upwelling. And uh, we've documented some of that in Bridge Creek. 
the increase in flow complexity due to the dams, uh, changes the type and distribution of your erosion and deposition within the, the channel, which leads to higher rates of habitat complexity um, and increases your floodplain connectivity, which can lead to a more complex multi-threaded channel. And again, watering the floodplain, which increases the riparian habitat, as well as the rearing habitat for fish. Um, and these things also benefit beaver that dams themselves. So switching gears a little bit, we can't forget that they can be problematic. And um, so a lot of the traditional removal methods have proven to not really work that well. Um, there's been some recent work from 2008 um, comparing living with beaver strategies to dynamite and lethal removal. And they found not only are they less expensive, but uh, they actually are more effective and you can retain beaver on the landscape getting their benefits. Um, there's a variety of different ways you can do it, but essentially they're all variations on sort of piping and fencing to control pond elevations as well as prevent unwanted harvest of trees or prevent them from building dams in places you don't want them. So a lot of guidelines on how to do this. This beaver restoration guidebook is, is, is a good one. Um, and then you can write a lot of these living with beaver strategies up into adaptive management plans. So we had the opportunity to develop a couple of these back in Utah. And uh, we did one for Walmart and one for the Utah Division of Wildlife Resources, where you basically it's just common sense stuff. You're identifying what the potential problem areas are for a particular area and then coming up with some solutions, simple solutions of how to deal with it. Um, OK, so restoration by rodents. It's not a new idea. Um, people have been doing this as early as the 30s. They were parachuting uh, beaver in California here to a variety of places in the 20s and uh, all the way up to the 50s. Um, and uh, you know the logic is simple: take them where they're not wanted, put them where they are wanted. Interesting quote here in the bottom. This is from Donald Tappy from CDFNG in 42. He was the one who actually originally established that historic range, which has been shown to be a little inaccurate. But he's even saying, "Hey, we should bring these beaver back. They, they're important. They help us with erosion problems." Popularity is growing rapidly in California. There's all kinds of folks involved with beaver-assisted restoration. For example, the Yurok tribe right now is, is working with Rocco Fiore on a tributary to the Lower Klamath River estuary where they have some natural beaver dams. Again, that screen is going to be your better option for seeing some of the details there. But um, essentially, beaver are already there, and they're working with them to try and improve habitat for coho. Um, there's a variety of different ways to do this, going from a real passive approach, just kind of let them be, to go all the way to build your artificial beaver dams and, and maintain them yourself. Um, so what are these beaver dam analogs? Real quickly, they're just simple in-stream structures meant to uh, mimic the form and function of beaver dams. And you can build them using manual labor or hydraulic post pounder. And you can build a lot of them real quickly. Uh, they're meant to work together in these complexes, similar to the way that uh, natural beaver dam complexes work. And um, in a lot of places where we've been using them, they, they seem to work pretty well. So it doesn't make sense to do this everywhere, so we need some tools to figure out where. Um, the beaver restoration assessment tool is one tool that has been used quite a bit in Intermountain West, and it's a dam capacity model that essentially just tells you where and at what level it makes sense to um, think about partnering with beaver and restoration, where dams can be built and sustained. Uh, it's been vetted. There's uh, peer-reviewed literature out on it, and, um, and, and it's being widely used in the Intermountain West. We're looking to uh, use it here in Northern California and fine-tune it to be more reflective of the different hydrologic conditions here versus the Intermountain West. Main thing is the dam building capacity model, but it also has these decision support and planning tools that kind of fit with that. So wrapping up, um, there's a lot of opportunities for beaver-assisted estuary restoration. Um, beaver are native to California's estuaries. They are keystone species that profoundly influence the type and distribution of habitat and um, specifically creating off-channel habitat critical to the recovery of coho. And we can mimic them building BDAs, um, but they don't make sense everywhere, so we need some tools to help us prioritize beaver-assisted restoration. And with that, there's a lot of people who have been doing this work that um, I'd like to thank, and if there's any time for questions. Thanks.